Great, thanks, Madison. And welcome everyone to our June uh, TPCC, where we'll be hearing from two speakers about wetlands in a changing climate. Um, and so just to, to kick us off, I we have a brief icebreaker, um, which is what is your favorite summer activity? So feel free to um, fill that out while uh, we give a little bit more introduc introductory information. Um, so can we go to the next slide, Madison? Great, thank you. Um, okay, so for those of you who haven't joined us before, um, the mission of TPCC is really to um, try and do these five things, aid in improving climate communication skills for all, improve climate change related data collection and sharing, motivate and support community-based adaptation, increase climate change conversation in more sectors and broaden the impact, and include and consider climate justice in each conversation. So we invite you to please consider the mission and contribute to our collective ideas and efforts as we work towards community resilience. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the individuals and groups that are involved in supporting the climate conversations, including Minnesota Sea Grant, Wisconsin Sea Grant, the Northern Institute for Applied Climate Science, 1854 Treaty Authority, uh, Minnesota DNR, and NOAA. And um, just so everyone knows, there's, um, there are recordings of previous presentations and the upcoming schedule at the Minnesota Sea Grant website, and I believe Madison will put a link to that in the chat. Um, and again, we'd like to invite you to submit any questions that you have during the presentations in the chat box. Um, we'll have time at the end of our presentation for questions and discussion with our speakers. So without further ado, um, it looks like, let's see, we've got a few poll responses, um, so we can share those. Yeah, and it looks like hiking is the number one favorite summer activity, but um, there's lots of other great activities in here too. So thanks everyone for um, filling that out. Okay, so um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Kyle McGarra, who is the local government outreach specialist for the Wisconsin Wetlands Association. And his talk is titled Adapting to Climate Change with Natural Flood Management. So he'll be telling us about a unique partnership effort to adapt to the changing climate in Northwest Wisconsin. And after Kyle presents, we'll have time for a few short um, questions. And then Hillary will introduce the second presentation um, and give you some background about that. So Kyle, if you're ready, I will let you take it away. All right, thanks Natalie. And uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here today. So I'm just gonna pull my screen up real quick <clears throat> and we'll get going here. So I'll be uh, talking today about uh, work that's going on in Northwest Wisconsin and uh, the concept uh, that the Wisconsin Wetlands Association has been promoting as one climate adaptation and hydrologic restoration strategy um, through a lot of our work. And on the screen, you actually see, um, I'll be talking a lot about the Marengo River watershed, which is a, a sub watershed of the Bad River and feeds right in, in, in into Schwamigan Bay. And on the screen, you, um, this is one site where in, in looking at it, um, you know, may appear as a healthy, well-functioning wetland, um, but due to changes in hy you know, hydrology over time, this area is, is really starting to convert into a, an upland area and is not performing uh, the hydrologic or geomorphic functions that you might expect in a, a resilient watershed. It's uh, because of the, our road, and, and road and agricultural systems and the way we've degraded hydrology. So I'll be giving examples of this and how we're really trying to key in on those fundamental hydrologic processes, which it underpins um, NIAC's uh, climate adaptation menus and a lot of what you'll, you'll see in the, in the literature uh, in both climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, so for those unfamiliar with the Wisconsin Wetlands Association, we're a statewide nonprofit organization uh, that strives to be science-based and nonpartisan. Uh, we implement uh, our mission and, and theory of change through a lot of place-based work, uh, legislative and, and other activities uh, that tries to pr promote the idea of wetlands as solutions to our various land and water problems. Natural flood management, which I'll be hitting on throughout the, the course of, of this uh, talk today, in, in the simplest terms, is about rebuilding the landscape's natural capacity to store and manage water to reduce risks. So really about a, a risk reduction strategy 
that it's thinking about uh, not only uh, storage and connectivity, but ways to mitigate the erosive energy of runoff and flood flows. And, and uh, achieving that goal uh, by reconnecting channel, floodplain, and wetland systems, working with or mimicking those natural processes and trying to recover self-sustaining conditions and those hydrologic processes on both reach and catchment scales. All of this work um, is really an extension uh, of the Salova flow strategy that has been common throughout the, the Lake Superior Basin um, and, and has driven a lot of the runoff management and water quality work in the region. So one, one common, I think, perception, maybe not with, with this group, um, but when thinking about Lake Superior, um, you know, the, the tributaries and watersheds are, you know, often you know, like in the lake area management plan, are often cited in, in fair condition, but as a whole, you know, Lake Superior is, is generally perceived as, you know, the more, more pristine, uh, you know, uh, hydrologic system of the, of the Great Lakes. And in, in comparison, uh, that, that is probably true, but that does not mean that it's an area that is, is not fragile or at risk uh, to, to changing conditions. Uh, we, there's a lot of relic gullies and ravines and, and, the, and some of the hydrologic modifications that are, uh, you know, that really stem from the, the clear cuts that happened in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the, the ditching that occurred and, um, you know, to remove uh, some of the smaller or even larger wetlands from the landscape and convert those over into working lands. And also the uh, uh, beaver removal is, is sometimes overlooked in terms of the effects of the pre uh, clear cut era and what those might have done in, in contributing to you know, the declining uh, watershed health that, that may still be evident today. Um, you know, the, this area, um, you know, whether Minnesota or Wisconsin has been hard hit by you know, extreme floods, the 2016 flood, which really anchors and, and drives a lot of our work in the, in the uh, Lake Superior region, um, these, you know, are, are large events and, and maybe unique, but um, they're really exposing problems that have historically existed because of those change, the, the way we've altered our landscapes and re-engineered water. So even though it, it, it may uh, seem daunting uh, with the amount of water that we're receiving, um, the, the, the solutions are really going to be about uh, identifying ways uh, to, to rebuild uh, those fundamental hydrologic processes that are critical to watershed health and resilience. And of course, um, with these big floods, we've, we've started to see, to see uh, correlation with the, the uh, HABs and, and some of the water quality impairments that are occurring out, out on the Big Lake. The, here's a map of the Marengo River watershed. Um, the, um, and really uh, the, a mapping of the repetitive loss or the, the frequency of damages that have occurred since 2012. There's been a lot of historical damage uh, prior to this, but in working with Ashland County, and I, I need to acknowledge uh, uh, up top that a lot of this work would not be possible without the, the, the leadership and support of the county conservationist, Mary Jo Gingras, and the emergency, emergency manager, Dorothy Tank. And in response to these floods and starting to think about uh, what potential solutions are, uh, we worked with Ashland County uh, to scope and develop a FEMA Advanced Assistance Grant, uh, which is basically a planning grant uh, that funded the um, a watershed scale risk assessment, which is ongoing. Um, we're in, uh, starting to enter into year two of that project. But really, the, the, the focus of that is to identify where there's degraded hydrology and understand um, where there's fluvial erosion hazards. That's uh, FEMA terminology. And I'll provide some definition, but definitions of that in a second. But fluvial erosion hazards are really the, the gullies, the ravines, the incised channels and ditching that have accelerated erosion and sedimentation and have caused uh, a lot of the washouts that you see on the screen here. And through that process, we're hoping to prioritize where stream, floodplain, and wetland restoration can occur, i.e. natural flood management projects. And we'll be developing policies and procedures that will help uh, facilitate uh, these nature-based projects uh, through a, a hazard mitigation uh, setting. Uh, many of uh, the towns in the, the Marang, this is a very rural landscape, um, the many small towns, 600, you know, populations and less and, and very lean budgets. So in the town of Ashland, about 75% of their budget is going to road maintenance. Um, and it's, you know, very difficult for these small communities 
to proactively invest in their infrastructure. Uh, they, they recognize that many of their uh, culverts are small and undersized, misaligned, uh, but they simply just don't have the budget. And so um, there, and the town of Ashland too is also in a very unique uh, hydro geomorphic setting where the, their, their upper portions are in sand and bedrock, moves through that uh, soil transition zone that uh, overlays uh, the glacial Lake Duluth and those paleo lake shores, uh, which can be uh, naturally unstable and then down into the red clay. So it's uh, just from a, their, their physical setting, uh, there's also a lot of challenges in, in, in think, taking a watershed approach and looking at, at some of those upstream hydrologic stressors. So that is really the, the, one of the driving questions of, of that, the risk assessment that's being funded by FEMA is looking at in, in the upper portions, you have you know, pretty intact hydrologic systems, but they unravel very quickly as, as you move down through the watershed. You, you see these uh, repetitive catastrophic washouts that have been occurring. And though the, some of the problems may be because of their structural or undersized, um, there, there's also the, the effects of those, those uh, landscape alterations that have really made the, these storms bigger and faster and, and uh, causing them to be uh, uh, very much at risk. So in thinking about, you know, the targets are, are really in what, what, what's happening in a healthy system, real quickly, just some, some uh, refresher material, you know, and think about active connected floodplains you, and, and what uh, and floodplains you have your, you know, many side channels, uh, multiple combination, different depths and velocities that uh, you know, sedge meadows or, or wet meadows that uh, may be out and interacting with different forested uh, islands. But it really, floodplains are messy. Uh, healthy floodplains are messy, and you, you'll have that those the roughness features, and a, a very uh, easy ability for those flows to get out and to interact with that floodplain. Um, but as we've uh, channelized flow either from uh, you know historic land conversions or the, the bigger storm events that we're starting to see. Um, those those uh, intact uh, floodplains, those wet meadows that may have uh, historically existed in, in some of these ravine systems or in those broad flat areas, they're really starting to unravel where you have an entrenched channel like you see on the left, right, in, in both, both examples where a lot of sand is, is coming from the headwaters and uh, as you see this, uh, you know, the incision and that down cutting starting to activate and worsen and disconnect uh, the floodplains and wetlands um, from the main uh, stream network and, and, and really you know, small headwater streams. And when, as that sediment and water and debris is displaced down into the lower parts of the watershed, you get what uh, Dorothy Merritt refers to as the Pompeii effect. Uh, Dorothy spoke at our recent hydrologic restoration symposium at our annual science conference. And, and, and this is very mu much common in, in like the driftless region as, as one example or in, a, in more uh, Southern agricultural landscapes. But a, a lot of our floodplains and wetlands have been buried by that, the historic sedimentation and creates um, you know, a fire hose effect or an inability for those flows, even low flows to get out uh, and to interact with the floodplains. So where are there opportunities uh, to, to uh, you know, disrupt or uh, to reconnect um, th those hydrologic systems? So through the FEMA project and, and some demonstration projects, which I'll talk about here in a second, uh, we're really trying to identify ways uh, through remote sensing monitoring and, uh, and uh, you know, field recons through geomorphic assessments to identify where those hydrologic connections are occurring and really stressing or undermining the functions of our headwater areas. So looking at gullies and sizing channels, ravines and head cuts. And those, because of our small erosional features that can be difficult to detect through traditional remote sensing methods. So uh, puzzling through a, a lot of, of those methods right now to identify where there's opportunity for process-based uh, hydrologic restoration. I, and this, I'm going to violate the, all the PowerPoint rules here, but I'll, um, the, right now, the, the, the main point of, the, of this slide is that uh, we're in the middle of developing a method, an interdisciplinary method, for combining hydrologic, geomorphic, and socioeconomic factors uh, to have an integrated watershed scale risk assessment process 
for, for under, understanding where those hydrologic degradations are and then combining it with uh, where there may be critical uh, economic structures or amenities um, that might help to elevate the priorities for where you might intervene in these unnatural gully cycles uh, as a way to protect and re or reduce the risk to public infrastructure. So we're still refining this approach, um, but the idea is to have a, a you know, evidence-based approach that uh, uh, FEMA will accept, and hopefully uh, as a way to unlock uh, hazard mitigation money and disaster recovery money for watershed restoration activities. Uh, through process-based restoration, if you're unfamiliar with, with that concept, I highly recommend uh, this manual, but the idea is to allow the system to do the work and to intervene in the, in the, the channel or the channel or va valley evolution uh, models to try to nudge our, our systems back towards those stage, stage zero conditions or those anastomosing conditions where you have multiple side channels, high uh, floodplain and wetland connectivity within our watersheds. And in a more simpler uh, terms, it's, it's about how do we rehydrate those wetland and floodplain areas and converting uh, those incised channels back into more perennial, uh, highly connected um, uh, hydrologic systems. And so if we're going to achieve uh, resilience, that's about uh, rebuilding water storage, uh, reaping those ancillary benefits through soil moisture and, and helping to improve productivity for the farmers that may be operating uh, in the watershed near ravine systems like this one. And the ultimate goal uh, through that uh, uh, risk assessment is to identify reach scale or catchment scale uh, natural flood management projects like this one. This is a, a demonstration project that's underway that's being funded by the state legislature. And his idea of take, you know, utilizing multiple practices, working with multiple landowners um, and throughout a watershed uh, to, to uh, basically initiate that process-based restoration, letting the system do the work and matching the, the scope of the problem um, with uh, the appropriate amount of different restoration tactics or techniques. So in conclusion, um, in, in thinking about you know, pathways forward, um, this, this project and, and thinking about um, adapting to climate change, you know, Ashland County was one of the first Wisconsin counties uh, to incorporate climate science and adaptations into their land and water plan. And that's thanks to the, the county conservationist, Mary Jo Gingras. But we're, this project is dovetailing with a lot of um, you know, the, the climate adaptation focus of, of that land and water plan and, and trying to find linkages uh, between land conservation and emergency management, taking a, focusing on those fundamental hydrologic processes taking a headwaters down approach. Um, you know, it's, it's more difficult to react when you're in the, lower in the watershed, down on the coast, um, you know, trying to slow that water down before it becomes hazardous and, and too much of a problem. Uh, our work is really uh, shaped into focusing more on the rural and tribal communities and, and, and really trying to look at ways to shift uh, some of FEMA's uh, benefit cost uh, analysis and their other procedures to be more accommodating to the nature-based approach. And then really thinking about more of a headwaters and uh, that more of an upper upstream focus to, to finding solutions to some of those, uh, to set the, a lot of the infrastructure vulnerabilities that exist in the, in the Marengo and a lot of the other Lake Superior watersheds. Uh, thinking about ways to, to remove barriers, whether through permitting um, or uh, priorities or incentives in, in different programs. And natural flood management, even though focused on risk reduction and flood mitigation, these types of projects uh, can offer many benefits to water quality, habitat, groundwater, and, and so on. Um, so finding ways to uh, be more intentional about the, the multi, uh, the co-benefits of, of these different projects. Um, I, there's many partners that are working on this work. Um, you, you see, uh, I won't name names, but I, I do want to give a special thanks to the Northwest Regional Planning Commission, uh, Jason Lauman, and then uh, USGS, uh, uh, Faith Fitzpatrick, who have been uh, help uh, uh, some of the main contractors uh, or partners uh, with Ashland County on this work. Of course, Wisconsin Emergency Management and you know, helping us uh, navigate some of uh, you know, FEMA's uh, world and how we help unlock uh, additional technical and financial assistance for these types of projects. 
Uh, with that, I, I want to thank you for your time. I, I know I, I threw a lot at you, but I, I hope that gives a, a, a sense of uh, the, the, some of the natural flood management work, the, the hydrologic uh, assessment that's happening and the demonstration projects that will hopefully provide uh, opportunities to, to learn and adapt and to scale up uh, the natural flood management concept. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle, for sharing that presentation today. Um, we have uh, a few minutes for questions. If anyone has any specific questions for Kyle, um, I do see one in the chat from John. Um, is there a reference to the watershed risk flowchart slide that was just presented? Um, that is in development right now. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll have that in publication. Um, but if, if you wanted to reach out to me directly, um, I, I can share that. But that uh, right now we're working on an integrated fluvial erosion hazards and road stream crossing uh, protocol. Um, so that's intended to pair with the, the new Great Lakes uh, road stream crossing inventory method. Uh, so right now uh, that, that's just a, a, an excerpt from, from that method. Uh, and I'd be happy to share more and could share that that graphic. But right now, things are still in draft and, and we don't have a, a reference to, to provide at this point. Thanks, Kyle. And we will be compiling not only the recording from today, but also any resources that have been shared and sending those out in a follow up email. So um, Kyle or, or anybody will well, folks will be able to reach out to him and, and follow up with any of these resources as well. Um, so folks can, can definitely continue to enter questions in the chat or you should be able to unmute yourselves at this time and turn your camera on if you prefer to ask your question in person. Um, I see one more question in the chat from Kristen. Uh, curious on how you're planning to track or monitor the effects of your restoration work and how it mitigates damage downstream. Yeah, great question. Um, so the main monitoring focus that uh, we will be uh, incorporating or utilizing will be uh, time lapse hydrography. Um, so basically, that um, is a trail camera that points at a staff gauge and will allow you in those smaller ephemeral and intermittent streams uh, to look at uh, just different changes in, in flow behavior, um, you know, changes in erosion and sedimentation. Uh, but we're also in conversations of, of trying to utilize some of the edge of field uh, monitoring. And, um, you know, so if there are ideas, um, you know, I'm very much open to that, but um, trying to, you know, be explicit about what some of the restoration outcomes are and the, you know, the longer time frames that may be needed to, to see, you know, some of the, the recovery and, you know, and the incision and uh, reconnecting those systems. So um, it, but, for right now, the main focus will be utilizing that, that time-lapse approach to, to observe and, and see some of the changes that happen post-restoration. Thank you so much. And we will have time at the end for additional questions for both of our speakers. But at this time, we can switch gears a little bit and head over to Northeast Minnesota. Um, unfortunately, our speaker uh, from uh, Grand Portage was not able to be here live today, but she provided this 15 minute recorded presentation. Um, so we're gonna be hearing from Laurel Wilson, who is the wetland specialist with the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And she's going to provide an overview of a uh, a monitoring project that is looking to assess wetland health by examining waterfowl and her waterfowl and herpetiles in the 1854 seeded territory, which is present day Northeast Minnesota. So um, at the end of this recorded presentation, if folks have specific questions for uh, Laurel and about this project, I can do my best to field some of those. Um, otherwise we can compile questions and I could forward those along to her. And then we'll open things up for just general questions and discussion at the end. Hello, my name is Laurel Wilson. I'm the wetland specialist for the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And today I'll be telling you a little bit about a project we're working on conducting waterfowl and herpetile surveys in the 1854 seeded territory. So 
I want to start out by extending our thanks to the Bureau of Indian Affairs Circle of Flight Program for funding this project, the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe and Michael Northbird, who have worked with us to secure the funds and oversee the project, and the 1854 Treaty Authority, who stepped in to help with field work when we had travel restrictions in place because of the pandemic. Now, just a little bit about the importance of wetlands. Wetlands provide habitat for a multitude of wildlife species, but specifically for some culturally significant species that are important to the Minnesota Chippewa tribes, including wild rice, moose, and beaver. They also are very important in maintaining and improving water quality, which has cascading effects throughout our different ecosystems. Waterfowl and herpetiles are two groups of animals that rely on wetland habitats. Waterfowl include geese and ducks, and these are species that are typically hunted as game. Herpetiles are reptiles and amphibians, so that includes our salamanders, frogs, snakes, and turtles. These are types of species that are sensitive to climate change, so they can be really good indicators of whether there are changes in the wetland habitats that they rely on, specifically if there's a decrease in the quality of those habitats. The goal of this project was to look at waterfall and herpetile species at different wetlands across the 1854 ceded territory and to establish kind of a baseline of what those populations are like across these wetlands to give us a sense of where our wetlands are at as far as quality goes, and to, again, provide a baseline to compare future data against to see if there's been any changes. For this project, we decided to focus on three different types of wetlands, deep marshes, shallow marshes, and vernal pools. And we chose four of each of those types of wetlands across the 1854 ceded territory. So we have three wetlands in St. Louis County, three in Lake, three in Cook, and then three on the Grand Portage Reservation. Here you can see examples of deep marshes and shallow marshes. And as their names indicate, they are differentiated by the depth of the water. And that determines what types of plants can live in these wetlands, as well as the types of animals that will be using them. The deep marshes that we chose to focus on all had reports of wild rice. Vernal pools are seasonal wetlands that will have standing water in them in the spring and then dry up in the early summer. As you can see from these photos that were taken from a similar vantage point at the same vernal pool, you can see on May 18th, we had standing water and then by the end of June, it was all dried up. For our waterfowl surveys, we did a survey in the spring at all of the wetlands where we stood at a single vantage point and counted how many species we saw and how many individuals of waterfowl individuals we saw as well. In the fall, we focused on deep marsh wetlands with wild rice and we conducted a round count. So we paddled around the outside of the wetland and counted again the individuals we saw and the species that we saw. Here are some of the results of those surveys. We almost exclusively found waterfowl just at the deep marsh wetlands. So that's the, the four names across the top right here are the names of the deep marshes that we surveyed. So this box is around three species that we saw exclusively in the spring, golden, uh, common golden eye, 
mallards and ring neck ducks. In the fall, we had a suite of different species that we saw, including American black ducks, American coots, and blue winged teals. And you'll see down here, the trumpeter swans were found pretty commonly at all of the wetlands. And these, we even found some that were nesting, which can have a pretty big impact on the wild rice populations. So here's what those uh, trumpeter swans sound like in our deep marsh wetlands. So this graph shows the results of these waterfowl surveys and, and we have them separated out here by spring versus fall and just general count of number of individuals versus the number of different species that we saw at each site. So you can see that in the spring we saw the n greatest number and greatest diversity of waterfowl species at Stone Lake, whereas in the fall we saw the greatest diversity and number at Elbow Lake. For our herpetile surveys, we conducted these in the spring in May and early June, and we did three different types of on the ground surveys. A basking survey where we looked for turtles that were sunning themselves on rocks and logs, a dip net survey, so doing a sweep of a net into the water, mostly focused at the immature individuals, and then a visual encounter survey targeting mostly eggs and adults. We also conducted an auditory survey that I'll talk about more in just a minute. Here's an example of one of our wetlands on the left. It's a shallow marsh wetland, and we'll give you an example of what it felt like to be at this wetland in the spring when we conducted our surveys. You can hear a frog calling pretty repeatedly and there are quite a few individuals. This is a particularly small frog, so it's a bit of a challenge even to get these photos I took on the right. This is a boreal chorus frog, just one example of a herpetile species that we saw frequently in our surveys. Our auditory surveys were focused on herpetile species that call or actually make vocalizations that can be monitored just by those sounds. So that includes frogs and toads. And to do this, we put out monitoring boxes. You can see a picture here on the right of what those look like. Those were put out in the field in April and May and collected in September. We were limited because we only had six of these devices. So they were put out at three deep marsh wetlands and three vernal pools. And they were set to record at five minute increments every 30 minutes or an hour that varied between the times of 5 p.m. and 3 a.m. Once we retrieve the recorders from the field, we have to do an additional step to analyze that information and pick out what species are calling at what sites. And we're also looking for what their first call date is. On the left, you can see a capture of what the analyzer is that we run all of our samples through. The lines, the bluish light blue lines on the bottom are the visualization of a call. And on the right side, we can see what we're looking for in a specific species, a spring peeper. So even before we play the call, you can see that it's likely going to be that species just based on, on what the call comes out as in this uh, visualization. But let's take a listen to the call just to verify that. And there you can hear that in fact it is a spring peeper call. I 
as you might imagine, we found more than just frogs on the recordings that we took. So here's an example of one animal that stumped us for a while. It was suggested that it might be a yeti or an alien at one point. Turns out that that is the call of a courting male common merganser. Here we have the results of our herpetile surveys. This table on the left hand side shows all of the names of the different wetlands that we surveyed. They are grouped by wetland type. So the first four on the top are deep marsh wetlands. In the middle are shallow marsh wetlands and on the bottom are vernal pool wetlands. And across the top, we have all of the different types of surveys that we conducted. The numbers in the table represent the number of species that we encountered during these different types of surveys and at the different wetlands. We only encountered two turtles. You can see those denoted under the basking species richness column. Those were found at Elbow Lake and Stone Lake and we only found salamanders at one vernal pool wetland. They were actually salamander embryos and those are pictured on the picture on the left. The rest of the species that were encountered are frogs and toads. So in the red box, we have total richness for on the ground surveys or the total number of species found in on the ground surveys. And it's kind of variable across all of the different wetland types, but when we compare that with our auditory recorder species richness, you can see that the auditory surveys actually produced a greater number of identified species at each of the wetlands than the, all of the other on the ground surveys combined. So we have the deep marsh wetlands, for example, there were five different herpetile species identified through auditory surveys versus the one, two, and three species identified through the on the ground surveys. And here's another recording from those auditory surveys. Here we have a green frog and a mink frog. The information that I've presented to you today are just general results that we've seen from one year's worth of data collection. What we would like to note is that for our waterfowl surveys, we would really like to continue doing these, but to do additional surveys in order to really get a better idea of what the waterfowl populations are using these wetlands that we're surveying. We were limited because of travel restrictions in place in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So in the future, we hope to do at least three dates in the spring of waterfall surveys in addition to the one in the fall. For herpetiles, we found that auditory surveys were the most successful and really provided us a better look at what species were using the wetlands over the course of the year. The on the ground surveys, since they were just conducted in a single day, only provided a really a snapshot of what was happening on that single day. So the auditory surveys are likely what we'll use moving forward. It should be noted that these really only give you an idea of the populations of frogs and toads, but salamanders, turtles, and snakes require quite a lot more surveying in order to get a better idea of their population. And we think that by looking at frogs and toads, 
we'll be able to generally get a good idea of how all of the herpetile populations are doing with those as indicators. We did find that the egg and juvenile identification was very difficult and would not recommend it to novices like, like me and um, some of our 1854 partners, just for a note in the future. We do plan to continue both of these surveys uh, as well as plant community assessments, invertebrate surveys, and water chemistry surveys in 2021 and 2022 with continued funding from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And we hope to both expand what we're surveying to get a better idea of the current conditions in wetlands in the region um, and also have that information to compare to find any changes in quality over time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this information to you today. If you have any questions, I am more than willing to answer them. My email and phone number are here on the screen. And I'll leave you with just one more recording that we have from one of our wetlands. So thanks so much to Laura Wilson for providing that uh, presentation. I'm sorry she wasn't able to be here live today, but um, we were one of the partners that helped out on this project. So if anyone has any questions, I can uh, try to answer them and or I can forward those along to Laurel and we will share that recording along with any resources um, when, with the follow-up email. And one thing I will add to um, her last slide there where she talked about future directions for the project, we did uh, expand this season, this field season. So we were able to conduct additional waterfowl surveys. We did uh, one survey per week at each of the locations. Uh, we also were able to collect invertebrates this year from each wetland. And those analyses will be done later this summer. And so hopefully we'll have additional results. We were also able to place a more acoustic recorders out this season. And we focused primarily on deep marsh wetlands that are wild rice waters. So um, hopefully we'll be able to continue to refine and expand uh, moving forward. But, um, but so far we have been successful in this, this 2021 field season of uh, building off of last year's field work. So I don't see any questions in the chat. If anyone wants to unmute themselves and we can just open it up for general questions for either Laurel or, um, yeah, so we can just open up any, any general questions. All right, well, if people are thinking or just don't have any questions, we can, um, I just wanna thank you all for attending today. Again, we will be following up with um, an email sharing the recording of today's presentation and any resources that were mentioned. Um, feel free, we'll also be putting a link to the Gov Delivery and Sea Grant website where the recordings are posted in the chat box. Um, and next month, our July Twin Ports Climate Conversation will be on July 20th. And this is gonna be a little bit of a different one. We're gonna be combining with the Minnesota Climate Adaptation Partnership, who also put on monthly webinars at the same time that we do. And so next month, we're gonna be joining and collaborating on those efforts. And we're actually going to be presenting on the Twin Ports Climate Conversation. So sharing a bit about how this organization began um, and some of the survey results and then some future directions of, of where 
we hope to move forward with these monthly climate conversations. So again, thank you so much for participating today and we look forward to seeing you next time.